Thanks. How's everybody doing today? Great. Probably, probably, probably maybe, uh, adjust that a little bit. So, all right. Well, great. Glad you're here today. Woohoo! It's a party, right? I always bring the party with me because I never, wherever I go, there's not always a party. So remember to bring the party with you. That's a good thing to do, right? All right. So um, before I get started today uh, and to say anything more, the thing I'd like you to do is I'd like you to join with me in, in a moment of silence. Today's a day that a day to remember. Um, a sad day in many a case, but a, a day to do. We can remember those who have fallen, uh, both on the 9-11 incident and uh, those who have given their all for not only our country but our counties and our cities and things like that so if you would please join with me in just a moment of silence uh, and remembrance of those people all right great thank you um, you know we live in a great country right Live in a great country that uh, that we ought to be proud to be here and to uh, have the freedoms that we have. So uh, I kind of wander around a little bit. So if somebody's taking video, I apologize to them, but that's just the way it is. I'm kind of a hyperactive, or I don't know if I'm ADD. I know I have a learning disability. Just ask my wife. Okay, <laughs> she tries. She's trying to train me for the last 40 years and you know, 35 years of marriage and 40 years of dating and everything, and it hasn't worked very well on her. She's very patient though, so that's a good thing. All right, I uh, don't want to spend too much time with me, but uh, uh, my name is Doug Handy, and I actually work for Liberty Mutual Insurance right now. I'm a safety consultant, uh, and I'm dedicated to the UPS uh, dedicated team. Uh, so Big Brown, I go out there and I teach safe driving, teach them how to handle some packages safely. Those people that work inside their buildings and moving and transporting all the packages that we like to get every, every day and that we, that we need, uh, I work with them. But for, uh, prior to that, for 27 years, I worked as a health safety environmental manager uh, for uh, different industries, 20 years plus in the aerospace industry. The, uh, I worked at, in the uh, nuclear industry, the heavy manufacturing industry, the truck manufacturing industry, and uh, several others. So I won't go through all that. You don't need to hear all This is not about Doug Handy. But uh, today I'm, uh, I was asked by, by Rod Hampson with the Utah Safety Council. I do some some training for, for them from time to time. So I'm kind of representing them, so I hope I do them justice, because they are a great organization. If you need any safety resources and things, they really have a lot of things that you can use. So uh, make sure that you get a hold of them and, and use their resources, they're awesome. So with that being said, um, and I am a CSP, I would just, uh, and one of the things that happened is uh, this year, my and I had a chance to go to Orlando, Florida, where I was a recipient of what they call the Award of Excellence, which uh, is given to the top CSP of the nation. And so far, there's only four. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm just uh, one of four recipients who have ever received that award. So that's a was kind of an honor for me. Very very humbling uh, to go through. So enough about that fun stuff. Let's get on with some other fun things, all right? Things we're going to talk about today are safety. So as I get started, let me just uh, do this. Somebody give me a definition of safety. What is safety? We talk about safety all the time, don't we? Okay, when we talk about safety this, safety that we're going to make things safer, what does that mean? What is safety? Don't all raise your hand at the same time. I can't take that many people. Okay, okay. <laughs> all right, what is safety? No ideas? You talk about it all the time, right? So what is it? Okay, being careful what you do. Okay, absolutely. What else? Bless you. What else? I think it's like a lot of other things. We know it when we see it, and we know it when it's the opposite. All right. When we see unsafe things, we know they're unsafe. When we see safe things, we know they're safe. How to put that in words is... Okay, absolutely. So what's the most important thing every day for you and your family? For everybody to make it back home, right? Without injury and in, in good condition, hopefully safe condition or better than when they left in the mornings, correct? Isn't that what you're trying to do every day? Okay, that's really what safety is about. It's about people. So I've been doing safety for, like I say, 35 plus years. And uh, people ask me a lot of times, Doug, what is, give me a definition of safety. 
give me a one, one word definition. My one word definition of safety is people. That's what we're trying to take care of, is it not? Trying to take care of people. And sometimes we're trying to take care of those people even though they apparently don't want to be taken care of. <laughs> you see them do some things that you're wondering, okay, who thought that up? Or what's going on there? But safety is really about the individual, how they do things and just get back every day to what they, what they need to, right? Most important, and at, or excuse me, at the UPS we call it the most important stop. Most important stop is not delivering your package, although that's important. The most important stop for our drivers and people at UPS is getting back home to their family. That's their most important stop. Okay, so that's really what it's about. So I would challenge you as you see things and people doing things unsafe that you would take a second and, uh, and uh, help them get home safe every day. All right, I know my wife, geez. She's used to this now, but uh, I'm, I'm one of those safety geeks, and uh, that's me, okay? And I, uh, as I go along, and if I go along in a grocery store and somebody's up on the ladder too high or they're doing something that's not right, they're not my employee, but I care about them. So what do I do? I stop and say, hey, you know, I, I know you're doing this. Uh, you know, here's a better way of doing that. I'd like you to go home safe today. And they're looking at me like, go away. You're not, you know, I don't, you know, you're not my boss. And I say, no, I'm, and a lot of times I'll tell them, I'm not your boss, but my goal is to get you home safe today. So take a moment, make sure you get home safe today, whether that's because you're not talking on your cell phone when you're driving or not doing some of those things. Just make sure you're doing the right things, all right? Fair? All right. Now, my wife and I would like to travel. And uh, so I, you'll see, I only have three or four pictures in here, but the pictures you'll see are pictures I've taken of different things and kind of appropriate, right? Where are that? Okay, so when they when they work and they work with sea lions or different types of animals or shamu, okay, what's the principles that they use? They use the principles of behavior. Of what they're doing and they get rewarded for the behaviors that they're doing, right? When they do the right behavior, then they get rewarded. That's kind of the principles of behavior-based safety kind of in a nutshell is we want to reinforce the things that people are doing well. And if they're not doing it well, or, or they're doing things at risk, then we want to help them. Okay, And it's a little bit different flavor than, than just regular overall safety compliance. All right? So you got a lot better pictures right here than you do up there. But <laughs> okay, But it's kind of fun to, as my wife and I travel around to, to see different things. So here's what we'd like to do. By the end of today, is what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to know some of the basic differences about traditional safety and behavior-based safety, how they work together, how they're really, they, they complement each other, they're not one replaces the other, okay? You need both of them if you're really gonna be uh, effective, okay? And we want to talk about how we're gonna quantify behavior and behavior-based safety things and how we, we, we make that work. So, we wanna talk about that, and really we wanna talk about the most important part of all behavior-based safety, and that is how do we give the feedback? Okay. How many of you have been to uh, to SeaWorld? You watch Shamu jump and whatever, right? What, are the, what, what happens right after they do the right thing? They give them a fish or something, right? That's the feedback. Hey, good job. Okay, how many of you like people telling you you did a good job? Anybody like that? <laughs> you hate that, no, don't tell me that, right? No, everybody likes that when you're doing good job. And that's kind of the, some of the principles we'll be talking about today. But that's not just about safety. That's what we're going to be talking a lot about, just normal human behavior, okay, and how that, how that relates. But before we get into that, I want you, we're going to talk a little bit about traditional safety and how that really affects how people do things and affects uh, the things that we do and how we are, our, our companies or how our counties, how things are set up within our organization to keep people safe. So we're talking about traditional safety processes. So let's talk about that for a second. How many of you have seen this slide before? Something like this. Iceberg effect, right? Okay. All right. Uh, very, very important when it comes. So we talk about the iceberg. Usually what happens is people maybe not may not realize, but the bottom half of the iceberg, the part that's underwater that you can't see, is usually three to ten times larger than what you see on the top. So when you are, when we're talking about the, uh, the Titanic, what's well, something Titanic? The top part of the iceberg or the bottom part of the iceberg? 
And it was the bottom part of the iceberg. Things that they couldn't really see. Yeah, they seen something there, but they didn't. And I have a whole safety presentation just on the Titanic, but we're not going to go through that today. Because <laughs> there was a lot of clues, a lot of things that happened on there that not only in the manufacturing process of the ship itself, but they took some shortcuts thinking nobody would know and how that really affected the overall outcome of what happened. But they also, when they, when they seen the icebergs, when they seen the things going on, when they got the reports from other people, what did they do about it? What did they do with them? They just kind of ignored them, stuck them in their pocket, right? I'll get to that later. We ever done that? We have something maybe come up, we just stay, oh, we'll get to that later. Yeah, let me tell you, when it comes to safety, let's not do that later. Let's do the safety stuff now, because that really affects how people do things. But if we look at this, and I'm going to start over. So we look at this right here, company. The company management and or safety department, and those, those are the things that we that are usually hear. And what they see is what most everybody sees is just what's at the top, right? They see the, the, the injuries, what happened, the final results. Okay, injuries are bad, by the way. If you haven't figured that out, injuries are bad. <laughs> anybody disagree with that? Okay, okay. And no, we can't choose who we get injured, do we know? Okay, I know that's people have brought that up, and as a true safety professional, I gotta agree, we can't choose them. I'd like to sometimes, but we can't choose who doesn't doesn't get hurt in these things. It's usually just a, uh, a chain of events that happen. So we usually see the injuries, and we see the incidents, those things that unfold. Somebody drops a brick, what happens? Well, if it lands on somebody or lands on their foot, then it's a problem, right? If it doesn't, we see, we see the incident, but we don't really take a look at that. So, and then the same thing, so if we're looking at it over here, same story, right? Okay, and so the thing we're really looking at doing is trying to look at the near misses, those things, or near hits, depending on whose terminology you like, okay? Near misses, near, near hits, those things that happen and nobody got hurt. Okay, the result came out favorable. Was it by chance or was it by... By, by, by plan, okay? And then, really, here's what we got to affect. And here's the biggest part of this. Anybody heard of Heinrichs? Heinrichs Triangle, Heinrichs, work of Heinrich? Okay, well, there's a lot of controversy on that, but Heinrich, Heinrich was a, uh, one of the fathers of industrial safety. He did a lot of work, studied how injuries happened, and he took a lot of data. And he's, what he did is he said, the top of the pyramid is the bad things, okay? The uh, injuries, Next were something that happened minor, maybe didn't require anything but a Band-Aid. And then at the bottom here was all these at-risk events. And it was kind of like a game of chance. But there's a lot more at-risk events, just like you see here. The bottom, there are a lot more at-risk events than would actually turn into injuries or, or, or problems. Okay, and so he did a lot of stuff on that. But who sees that? Who knows that in and out? It's the people who work closest to those risks, right? It's the employees, it's the people who are out there uh, putting the hot tar down on the road while people are going by at that reduced speed of 85 or 90 or whatever they happen to be going by at, is that right? Okay, so we have, but those are the people, those, those are the employees, those are the people right on the front lines who see really what the risks are. And we need to be paying attention to what they tell us because that is really what, what's going on. Because they get to see all of this we kind of know about it as management, but we don't know how important it is or what, what it takes. So as we're designing a process, as we're doing things in our, in our, op, in our uh, work sites, we need to make sure we get everybody involved, make sure that we're paying attention to those people. Because that makes a critical, a critical opportunity for us, okay? So everybody know the iceberg effect now, right? You only see certain things, but you don't really see the, all the bottom Things are going on, and those who are involved in it really do. So, let's talk about a couple of other things. You've probably, some of you who are in HR or risk management have probably seen these things before. Okay, this is the bottom half of a, a loss cost stream. So, losses, when somebody gets hurt, it usually costs us money, right? Okay, and there are two different types of costs. What, what are they? Direct cost and indirect cost. What are they? So, direct costs include what? doctor bills, prescriptions, we pay people for being off work, all those things, what about lost productivity? Is that included in that? 
generally not. It goes up into the indirect. You don't always see the lost productivity or what it takes to do that. So there's a lot of other costs. So if we went, if we went back to this here pyramid, it's the same type of thing for our cost. Here's our cost that we normally see, but everything else that happens when an injury or an incident happens is usually three to ten times larger that we just don't, we can't account for. How many exact minutes did that person stand around the water cooler talking about Doug Handy getting hurt yesterday? Right? Is that, is that productive or non-productive time? It may be productive, but it. Who, but we're that's not what they're getting paid for, right? We are, we, anybody got somebody on the payroll that just talk? That's all their job is. <laughs> okay, but we spend a lot of time doing. Okay, there's. Yeah, I know a lot of people talk. Like I said, there are I'm, there's some politicians, and that's all they have a chance to do sometimes. <laughs> However, you know, and there's some good out of that. So, does anybody don't not to shoot me at? Well, we got some sheriffs. Keep your guns down. <laughs> but, uh, as we go through the process, so uh, but your, usually your indirect costs are usually three to ten times larger than your than your overall cost. You just can't see them, okay? But it, when you take you know, take them to the bottom line, it all comes about. So take about the loss cost stream. Say that four times fast. Loss cost stream, <laughs> and uh, and you see is what happens is we have the cost at the end, and before that there's the claim. So we have a dollar so we paid out because somebody got injured, right? Okay, and then we have the harm that happened. They got, they, the injury actually happened because of the incident. Okay, so is, as we go through that, that's what we normally deal with on a daily basis and that's the top half of that, that iceberg that's above water. We can see all that, true? Okay, all right, and that's all reactive. Anybody disagree with that? Okay, so these are things that once the incident happened, these are good. This is going to go right down the chain. We're going to have that happen. Okay, uh, it, and we do need to make sure this happens. Don't. I know we talk a lot about proactive events. That's great, but you do need to do some for for reactive. Anybody uh, have any good examples of what of, of reactive benefits out of reactive events? <laughs> Absolutely, make sure it doesn't happen again. Um, there's something called OSHA. Anybody heard of OSHA before? All the OSHA laws are basically based around something has already happened and they don't want it to happen again, so they're going to enforce a law or regulation or something that's going to help you to not let that happen again. Okay? Um, most of the things like the right to know laws or the hazard communication or now the global harmonization thing all come about because of what? Bhopal, India, true? When 2,000 people were died because of that gas release in Bhopal, India. So they decided they didn't want that to happen again so they put in a bunch of laws and now you have a material safety data sheet, you've got labels on your products, you've got all these things that make a difference. All right, so I digress a little bit, but that's has gone. So now, really, the thing we want to do is move a little bit further upstream, okay? And we want to take a look at what our systems are that allow these things to happen, okay? So when we talk about, most of our things we're talking about when we talk about traditional safety fall into this realm here. The things we talk about when we go to a little bit more proactive safety measures like behavior-based safety is we try to take a look at what's happening upstream. What are those ice things under the water, those iceberg parts? Let's see if we can get rid of that iceberg chunk at a time. So if we can eliminate that iceberg from ever accumulating, we don't see it at all and it doesn't, doesn't do any, any harm to anybody. Are we okay with that? And those are proactive measures. Okay. So here's what happens is there's a lot of effort put into all these reactive things when we really ought to be putting our effort and get our return on investment on these things because if we get rid of the situation or the elements then guess what we don't have the injuries we don't have those things that are reactive are we okay with that okay i'm drawing them on a little bit but you need to understand a little bit basics and how that works so if you're doing something for your county for your area i would start looking more upstream what do we do how do we make sure we don't get people hurt and that's we've done a lot of those things right we put out cones or barriers or different things when people are working on the road so they don't they have less likelihood of 
having a problem with people are going by at that reduced 90 mile an hour speed limit that's going. That's unwritten, by the way, right? <laughs> as, you, as you go through the process. So, so we talk about damage control or process control, and that's really what we're looking at. We can control the process as we work, and that's what behavior-based safety will help us do, is take a look at that. So let's look at the system itself. Um, for any type of system, there are really three parts. There's the environment, which is the physical environment you work in, the type of equipment that you have, the type of machines you use, the you know the buildings that you work in, all that's the environment. True? Okay? And we have a lot of control over that as we set up buildings, and especially if you've got new buildings, you have control over over doing that. So we want to make sure we have a thorough understanding of what their environment looks like so we can control that. That's where this is where a lot of OSHA stuff comes in. Because they want you to make sure you have fire extinguishers, you have exit signs, you have those things to make sure you have an environment that will help people. True? Okay? So, the, um, so really the environment is about what we are, okay, what we have physically, what are the physical elements that we deal with. Okay, and then we have the capability. Capability is, what, 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 what affects somebody's capability? Talk about that, but what affects somebody's capability? Education, absolutely. What else? What's that? Injuries. Injuries, absolutely. So experience, okay. So if I did that, you know, that's why you have your brother put your hand on the hot stove, not you, right? <laughs> so that uh, you, you can you can get that experience without having that experience, right? So you have those type of things going on. So uh, so we talked about education. What about training? Is training and education the same? Okay, let me give you a quick, let me give you something, because it's important to understand training and education are not quite the same. Education is more about information, facts, things you're gonna do, and all that. Training is more how to do it and more hands-on, true? Okay, so let me give you an example real quick and you'll never forget the difference between education and training. Okay, about uh, 10 years ago, my daughter started high school. They sent me a, 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 a note, said so probably everybody's got one. Mr. Handy, will you allow your daughter to take sex, sex education in school? Anybody seen those letters? Okay, well, regardless of whether I said yes or no, in high school, did I want my daughter to have sex education or sex training? Okay. <laughs> Okay, which one? I mean, <laughs> think about it. Okay, <laughs> as you go, there's a difference between education and training. So, do you want somebody to have sex education or sex training? And I guess that depends on your lifestyle or what you're going on. In my, in my world, it was definitely not the training aspect that I was looking for my daughter to experience during high school. All right? So, we talked about training and education. They are different things as you go through the process. So, training and skills. You know, training. Uh, and education help us improve our skills. But our experience is another part of this capability thing because we learn things as we either get good results or not. True? All right, so then there's the other part of this system analysis and that is what they call motivation. Okay, what do we do? What are, are the behaviors? And motivation is not just about behaviors, but why would we do what we're gonna do? How, how do we do that? What's gonna happen as we go through the process? So, questions so far? Okay, so, and then you look right in the middle. What's right in the middle? It's called optimized system. So really, for us to be successful in almost any type of system, specifically safety, we need to have a good environment, right? We need to have a building or equipment that's gonna work and not malfunctioning. We need to have the maintenance process going on so we can make sure our, our equipment's not uh, failing or running out of fuel or doing whatever else in the middle of the operation. We got to have this solidly in place. We got to have the people who know how to use that equipment, know what to do when this things happens, know what to do when when uh, when things go start to go wrong. Can they can they correct them before they become something bad? True. And we also have to have this uh, motivation. We have to have people that want to want to be there. Anybody. Okay, you're probably, this is, this is a nice picture. Anybody else not want to be here today? 
Okay. <laughs> okay, so you, you're here for a reason, hopefully to learn something or to network or do something, so you have a motivation to, to come, right? Okay, and that, so motivation and behaviors, that's what we're focusing on. So when we talk about uh, traditional safety, we are basically talking about things that are either in the environment and the capability. Okay. When we talk about behavior-based safety, we're talking about some of the capability because we can train or, or educate people. We're all really talking about the motivation. Why do they do what they do? Okay, Are we okay with that? So traditional safety basically focuses on the environmental things. Okay, So things you can see. So also watching your building, do they go up and care what your employee's attitude is? Generally, they don't. They are usually looking for what? Yeah, they're usually looking for somebody to, that can help them because they're there to help you, right? Because as they come to help you, what are they looking for? <laughs> they're probably looking do you have fire signatures? Do you have excess signs? What's going on? Do you have the right things going on to, to keep your people safe? Do you have a lockout program? Do you have a way to repair your machinery or equipment or things that are going on so that people don't get hurt when you find a defect, right? They're looking for those type of things. They want to see your injury log. How many people in your environment have you injured in this last... How many years do did, did, did they look when they come look? They go back usually to look five years. They usually start with the current year and then they... Then go back five years, and that's what they usually look for. So when they come, don't give them any more than five years for sure. But <laughs> I wouldn't give them any more than they asked for. But they're there for a reason. They're there to help you to make sure that we have this environment part right. And then we've done the training. Did we train our people on lockout tagout? Did we do the right things? Okay? Comments, questions? Derogatory remarks so far? <laughs> okay. I am a second degree black belt in karate. Uh, I can show you some demonstrations if you like, but no, we're not going to do that today. But I can, I, I'll tell you the same thing that I tell my karate students. You can ask whatever you want once. So, okay. <laughs> uh, any, any questions so far? No, seriously, we've got questions, but glad, glad to help you. So basically, we're setting the foundation of what uh, traditional safety is. And the key drivers are usually OSHA regulations and requirements, right? Could be a company regulation requirements. What about costs? Do injuries cost your organization a lot of money? How many know how much money how much money is you spend? Anybody know? Just as fun thing, maybe someday you ought to go back and just ask that maybe when you get back tomorrow, just kind of say how much money we spent on direct costs, because that's the one cost you're gonna have, direct cost for injuries. And you'll be surprised how much money that costs you. Okay, uh, but so the, for traditional safety, the cost would drive that, and then the inspections. How many have internal inspection type things you go through? You audit your own information, you audit what's going on for things, okay? Is that a cost? And why, why do you do that? Do that for, for pre prevention? Hopefully that's a good thing. Do you, or do you do it because, oh sure, somebody told you you have to? Absolutely, that's a good that's a good answer. Yes, so those type of things. That's what really what the tr traditional safety is. Everybody knows what traditional safety. Everybody's been involved in traditional safety. True. Okay. You like traditional safety? Yeah, it's okay. The OSHA regulations are nothing to sit around and read. It's not a, not a good time to do. Um, I've read all of them. Not, not, a, not a lot of fun. Okay. So if you're looking for fun, that's not it. That's not where you're going to bring your party to. So let's see if we can. Well, let's see if we go to a video. Yeah, it's a pretty, pretty funny video. So what, what do you do when the boss comes? 
Somebody else get it, alright? changes his behavior by recognizing something else was going on, right? Okay, that ever happened in your house? You had your kids or anything? Yeah, yeah. Guilty as charged. <laughs> okay, so uh, as, you, as, you, as you go through this process, we're looking at behaviors. We're looking at things that happen. And so when we talk about behavior-based safety, we're looking at what the behaviors are. We're looking at what actually happened. Okay, the physical environment, the training, that was pretty good training by that dog, by the way. But anyway, the training <laughs> and the other education process were all part of the traditional part of life. Now we have the behavior side of life that we have to deal with, right? Okay? And, uh, you know, I don't know about that cat. I'd be, I wouldn't be sticking around that. <laughs> I mean, he probably won't be here. You know what I mean? He's going to eat the, the guy's sandwich, right? That cat is just a problem. Okay? So let's talk about behavior-based safety. Behavior-based safety mainly focuses on motivation systems. So, what's the what's the motivation for that for that dog? First, is food, right? <laughs> he gets all the fruit he wants and even drinks Pepsi. I don't know how that goes, but okay, <laughs> okay. So he's drinking Pepsi and he, and he thinks that's pretty good, okay. And he's not and he's never held accountable for that. So, how long do you think that's going to continue? As long as it goes, exactly right. So more, that's what we're talking about motivation. Remember that third circle is motivation. It's about how white people behave the way they do. Okay? Because he wanted a sandwich. Okay? And, and he can get that sandwich for free. All right? So we talk about the choices, are, and we're going to talk just a couple of minutes about the ABCs of human behavior. We're not talking about workplace behavior. We're talking about human behavior. Okay? ABC is a human behavior, okay? So, we, if for behaviors processes, we can set the focus to be on specific behaviors, not just general outcomes. We can say, is this person going to bend their knees or not when they go to lift that process? Is that person going to put their seatbelt on before they turn the ignition? Is that person, we can focus on specific things rather than general, uh, are you driving safe today? Okay? So when you get into behaviors, you focus more on specific things as you go through the process, as you go through. So, you know, uh, you know, we got the other example here of uh, using every step. Anybody ever trip on stairs? Probably everybody, right? Anybody ever trip on stairs because you're taking too many stairs at a time, or you're going too fast, and that kind of thing? Yeah, that's why they have a handle there, by the way. Okay, <laughs> they help you with that, and. Uh, and all that stuff. And there's all kinds of body mechanics of why you shouldn't take two steps at a time. Put your body equilibrium off balance. And put your back, your point center of gravity off balance compared to where your body weight is supposed to be, etc. So one step at a time. Those type of things. But if we focus just on tripping and falling on stairs, it, it that's a different thing rather than say, hey, use every step. Use the handrail. Those are specific things that you can see. So most behaviors, when we talk about a behavior, it's something you can see. Okay? Yeah, you may not think very well of me or somebody else, but you can't see that. Okay? But you can see what they do with the attitude that people have, the thing by what they do and how they do that. Okay? For example, look how many people are on the front row. Man, it's <laughs> and that's why y'all come early, just like we talked about before, you come early, just like you do in church, so you can get the back row. Okay? You don't have to sit on the very front. Okay, why? Why don't you want to sit in the front row? Let's talk about that. That's a behavior, right? You chose to sit where you sat. Why? Why? So you don't call on us. Okay, but you know, most of us, if I, you know, if my, my, my wife's from before 11, I always give her a hard time because she's, she's fairly short. What a beautiful gal, but she's, she's, she's pretty short, so I always tell her she's got she's to step up just to, just to reach the floor. 
Okay? For some of us who are taller than the tables, I can still see everybody in this room. I can still go on you <laughs> as you're going through. But in your mind, you're thinking, if I sit farther back, the less likelihood that they're going to call on me, right? Okay? And do you get away with it, just like that dog? Do you get away with it all the time? No, but it's you, you, you play the rules, you play, you play the risks, right? So, but we focus on different things. So if I want people to sit in the front row here, what, would I, what should I do? Give them a reward. Give them a reward, a different reward than what everybody else has, right? Yes. Or make it more uncomfortable, put spikes on the chairs or something. <laughs> the farther back you go, or do something else, right? That would change your behavior. Is that not true? Okay. So that's what we're talking about with behavior-based safety and, and uh, ABCs of human behavior. is about just controlling behavior and modifying that and motivating people to do the right thing. Okay, you okay with that, everybody? Okay. So behavior-based safety, a process that aims to create optimum performance in behaviors known to prevent incidents by, first of all, we want to involve everyone. If you have a good behavior-based safety process, everybody's going to be involved. We'll be looking at everybody's behavior. They're either going to be monitoring behaviors or being monitored for their behaviors. And it's not a bad thing to be monitored, or it's just you're helping each other out. In, in traditional safety, how many people get involved in the OSHA regulations? How many? Are any of you involved in the OSHA regulations? Okay, we got one or two people, three people out of the whole room. Okay, so if I want to get everybody involved by doing, doing traditional safety and say, read OSHA, we don't have a lot of people doing that, right? But in behavior-based safety, because we're talking about behaviors, we can involve everyone. Also, we can set up a measurement system through the observations to decide whether we're doing well or we're not doing well, if more training is needed, etc. Okay? Because we can adjust what's, what's right after we see what's going on. Okay. All right? So, and then uh, we focus is this, delivering reinforcing consequences when they do the right thing. Is that very common in, in the world today? When you do something well, does your boss come up to you all the time and say, good job? I won't ask for a raise hand because maybe some bosses <laughs> in here or whatever, but think about that, okay? When, you're, when your son or daughter or spouse or significant other does something you like, do you, do you let them know that? Or do you just take it and go? Okay, so one of the things that behavior-based safety does, it works on the human factors of motivation by when you do something right, you're told you're doing something right. And that gets people psychologically to want to do it on their own. Okay, so that's kind of the way things... Go. So, and then we can celebrate improvements. So, hey guys, we were only 52% uh, safe wearing our seatbelts uh, two years ago. Now we're 98% safe. We still got some improvement. We're 98% safe. Let's have a celebration. Let's do something else. Gives you a chance to do something. Okay. When, when, when do you get to celebrate tra traditional safety? Well, there's times we celebrate traditional safety. When, when do you celebrate traditional safety? This last week, we had the Utah Safety Council annual uh, lunch, and any, uh, hopefully you were all there. If not, they had some good things going on there. But they recognized companies for reaching a million man hours that, without an injury. Is that, that, is that a good thing? Okay. So traditional safety, if you're just looking at that, was that because they did all the right things or was it because they got lucky? For, for most of them, it's probably both. For some of them that really have good processes in place, it may be not a matter of luck. It's a, they minimize the luck by putting in the right processes. Okay? But for, uh, so we, we celebrate things and we, for nutritional safety only by the results that happen. But as we talked about before, what, what leads up to those, to those results? All those behaviors, all those things that get there, right? Okay? So let me ask you this, is uh, if I was going to um, try and change a light bulb here, what if I took a table and slid it over here, and I took five or six chairs and stacked them up on top of each other and changed that light bulb? 
<laughs> it'll be uh, may, maybe a very short show, right? <laughs> okay, but it'll, so if I did that, would I get hurt every time I did that? Okay. So just because we're doing an at-risk behavior doesn't mean we're going to get hurt every time. But if I do that enough, sooner or later I'm going to get hurt. Is that not true? And you may be the enforcement part of the Heinrich experiment thing says that the, the, uh, sooner or later by these at-risk events going on, somebody's going to get hurt. That may be the first time you did that, but you watched uh, you watched Doug Handy do that 50 times and never got hurt. Doug Handy was really lucky or really good or something, right? Crazy, I don't know. <laughs> to do that kind of thing, but that's that's what's going on. So we, we focus on behaviors to minimize the risk. We're all into risk kind of management, aren't you? Don't you? Look at risks. If you're a police officer, you look at the risk of how we're going to pull over a car. What do, I, what do I do? Do I just jump out and run right up there, or do I take it, take some time, survey what's going on, maybe approach from a different side, do something else, right? So that's that's how we go. So let's talk about this. So remember the the dog and the and the cat commercial here. And here's a here's something that we we focus on when we talk about behavior-based safety. It's not what you look at that matters, it's what you see. That's a beautiful picture, isn't it? That's on, that's on Amelia Island. I took that picture of sitting on Amelia Beach in Amelia Island, Florida uh, a year ago, just looking at the sun, sunrise. That was pretty nice. But it's really not, so what, it's not what I look at. What do I see? What do you see? You don't see anything? Okay, those are actually, yeah, these, these three, those are actually cranes. There's a large uh, sea cranes that are out there flying. Just happened to catch them right in the right thing. What else do you see? Okay, you see all kinds of different things like, uh, the, the, you know, is the tide coming in or out? The waves coming in or out? Is it calm or, or not? What about the sun? Is the sun up yet? Okay. So when you look at things out in your, your area, in your workplace, at your house, what do you see? Do you, do you see the cat on the counter? Or do you see some details and some other things going on? What do you see? Do you see a bunch of people standing around? Or do you see people doing that? Do you see people working? Just a group of guys working or gals working? Or do you see the individual things they're doing? Oh, they're not, they're putting their hand in this machine. They're not, they haven't, they haven't chalked their, their wheels. They haven't done whatever it's going to be to make that, make that, so you, it's not what you're looking at, it's what you see. So make sure that you're looking at the things that make a difference to you. Let's talk about the ABCs of human behavior. Very, very critical. ABCs of human behavior, okay? Antecedent. Everybody knows what antecedent is, right? No. Us safety geeks know what antecedent is, okay? Antecedent. Okay? In Spanish, it's ansiedente. Ansiedente. And everybody knows that it, taught, it means what comes before. How many of you remember the Pavlov's dog experiment that you read about or heard about at school? What happened? Somebody tell me what happened. The dog was conditioned to react in a certain situation. You're exactly right. So they rang the bell, right? And that dog became conditioned. So first they rang the bell and... They put some food over here, so what did the dog do? Went right over the food, right? And they did that for a set period of time. Every time they rang the bell, that was food for the, for the dog. So what, is, so what did the dog think? That's right, they ring the bell, there's dinner time, right? Every time, there's dinner time, okay? Then, then, then what they do? Then they rang the bell, but they didn't give the dog any food. What did the dog do? He went right over and waited, right where that food came in, and he saw it. Just waited and waited and waited. Didn't move. He waited for that food. Okay? So, that, the antecedent is the ring of the bell. 